Okay. Hello, everybody. I am so excited for this uh, conversation with Dr. Karen Becker and Rodney Habib um, that you're about to get access to. We are pre-recording this because their book at the time of this recording is actually not out there just yet, but it is going to be available to you as you're going to be uh, listening to this. And I cannot even begin to tell you, oh my gosh, this is a, this is, this will not only uh, forever change you as the title infers, it will forever change the life of your dog forever, which is kind of like what we always want is our dogs to, they are with us forever and ever as they talk about in this book, but you know, those quality years that they get to spend with us. So for those of you who are first tuning into the Dog is Good Lifestyle Show, I am Gila Kurtz. I am one of the founders of the Dog is Good brand. And, uh, you know, for years and years, all we are a brand that has always focused on the bond between the human and their dog. But more importantly, we really dive into deeper uh, these days in terms of the impact that these incredible creatures have on our lives day after day, which then makes it possible for us to have greater impact in the world around us too. And uh, given that we want them to be with us always, I've, I've always followed the work of these two incredible individuals that I'm about to um, introduce to you more formally here in a moment. Uh, but I just, I, I just feel that the work that they are doing is uh, the beginning of a very powerful and important movement not just for your pets, but for you as well. And so my intention uh, as we talk and have this conversation today is that it will uh, really peel back the layers of what can be a very confusing way uh, when we're looking at ways to uh, support the health and well-being of our pets and that it will spark interest not only in uh, getting the book yourself and learning, but it'll also provoke conversation conversation between you and other dog lovers, conversations within the science community, and that they truly will see the fruitions of their core mission to change the way we see um, health and well-being for our pets and really to be proactive in that, in that process. So anyway, I want to welcome our guests here, Dr. Karen uh, Becker's deliberate common sense approach to creating vibrant health for companion animals has been embraced by millions of pet lovers around the world, making her the most followed vet on social media. She spent her career as a small animal clinician, empowering animal guardians to make intentional lifestyle decisions to enhance the well-being of their animals. Dr. Becker also writes and lectures extensively and serves as a wellness consultant for a variety of health-oriented organizations. She is the first veterinarian to give a TED Talk X on uh, talk on species appropriate nutrition, which has been a lifelong passion of hers. And Rodney Habib is the most influential pet health leaders in the world. He's a filmmaker, multiple award-winning blogger, sought after speaker, founder of Planet Paws, the world's largest pet health page on Facebook, and more importantly, a pet parent. His honest and no-nonsense take on pet health and massive social media presence has gained him worldwide recognition. His 2017 documentary on the canine cancer epidemic, the dog cancer series accelerated his influencer status, leading to viral videos capturing more than 530 million views. Whoa, I have to say, I think that's when I first discovered you, quite honestly. Um, but numerous uh, TV, social media headlines, movie, it, the list goes on and on and on and on. Um, He's uh, uh, Dr. Marty Goldstein's upcoming box office movie on um, pets. Oh, part of Ty Bollinger's um, upcoming Truth About Cancer series. And most recently, uh, two appearances on Conversations with Maria. Uh, I can't say her last name. Min Minus. From Minoas. <laughs> Thank you. Who needs the rest of yes. all of that I stuff? Have, I should have that? Let's talk about dogs. Yes, I should, have, I should have practiced that better. But um, I mean, clearly, you guys, these are the world-renowned experts, and not just experts, but they lead with their hearts in this conversation. So really excited and looking forward to um, all that they will share. And so I'm going to just start off with just a small little um, snippet out of the introduction to their book, um, where... Uh, a, they said, a dog has found a forever home with you. And I, this is where I added it. And that was just, you know, the core piece. 
um, we owe it to them to make better choices, to enhance their well-being. So their overall life experience is as extraordinary as they make ours. That's that's just something I believe. And at the at the bottom line is it is completely up to us, which is why they are doing this work to educate us. So I want to start off first. You have a formula. Um, well, first, congratulations again. Mm, I know you, you said it was we're, a labor of love. I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've written a book before myself, and I I'm, I know that there's a lot that goes into it. What was the timeline, the time frame for getting all of this pulled together and getting it getting it out there in the world? Well, I mean, literally, it's been a, a cultivation, uh, probably for Dr. Karen Becker. I'm going to say decades, and you know, for for myself. Um, for as long as I've started this journey, God knows how long I've been on it for. But it's basically, you know, Gila, the entire, our, our entire life's work, if you may, a how-to manual to put together um, to help increase the lifespan of dogs and using the latest science. Uh, we really, really have been working on this. I can't tell you how hard. I don't even remember the days anymore, but it feels like it's been an eternity. Yeah. I, I think the... The inspiration has come, as you mentioned, from our, our depth and breadth of living with dogs and experiencing dogs and seeing the magic of dogs, but also the heartbreak and re regret mm -hmm. of both of us saying to each other, if we only knew then what we know now. And I think that when we went from our desire to write the forever dog to actually doing it was about three years ago when we started meeting some of these top longevity researchers and the information that they were sharing with us actually studying some of the oldest dogs in the world that's when we looked at each other and said we have to get this information out so three years is what has been with an active yeah. project of intentionally trying to coalesce the information and then get it organized into a strategy that is easily digestible for the first time pet parent, but also gives all the science for the hardcore longevity junkies, researchers, veterinarians, the, the research community that wants it all in one place. So we've been working hard about three years on this. Yeah, well, it's fantastic. And I really love the uh, approach that you take to uh, pulling together the book. And so I wanted to launch in first because you actually have a formula with the acronym DOG. If you could just explain that formula, um, that would be helpful. So the DOGS strategy is what we came up with as an easy to understand and assimilate stepwise approach to all of the things you need to consider to actively remove lifestyle variables uh, that could negatively impact your dog. So the D of course is for diet and nutrition, the foundational thing that we do on a daily basis to either you know, every bite of food we put into our dog's mouth is either healing or harmful and the decision is up to us. So that first section, the first uh, you know chunk is diet nutrition related. O stands for optimal movement, which is making sure that you are customizing exercise protocol for your dog and your dog's needs. G is for genetic predispositions and all dogs have them. So what are we doing to up or down regulate that genetic potential? And then S is for stress in the environment. And that is both physical stress, emotional, mental stress, indoor household stress, outdoor chemical stress, as well as veterinary chemical stressors. So that entire environmental stress section, as you know from reading the book, is really quite massive. It tends to be the aspect that most dog owners tend to overlook. So we put the entire strategy together in this DOGS formula to make sure that dog owners are not overlooking any one aspect of intentionally creating well-being. So good. And I just, I, I'm going to like be writing some notes. So you're seeing me right uh, look down. That's exactly what I'm doing. The you just said a tweetable soundbite that I think would be really important. Uh, I mean, everything that you talk about is so relevant for us too as people. But mm -hmm. we are the guardians of our, our dogs uh, who cannot make any choices for themselves in that regard. You just this statement that you said really struck me. Um, everything that we put, or every decision we make for our dogs, is either healing or harmful. So what choice are we going to make, right? So that that was really powerful. I just want to call that out um, before I ask you. The, the book is um, <laughs> it's structured so beautifully and so easily for as a reader to to follow and get educated. And so because I want everyone to get this so much, could you just share with them what they can expect in terms of like the the way it's divided up and how it is a, a appropriate for all levels of uh, dog lovers? Um. Well, 
Rodney was in charge of collecting all the information, getting all the interviews, talking to all the scientists, talking to all the oldest dogs and the owners of the oldest dogs in the world. He had to go get all the background information. And then I had to try and put it together. So I set this book up as the problem, kind of like where, why we have a problem historically, what the research says about the problem and then how to fix the issue. So it's a background, uh, you know, it's where we're at, how did we get here and then how do we come out of it basically. Uh, so the last part of the book is more of the how to, uh, hands on step-by-step -step guide to addressing all of these variables to make a plan. I think the biggest issue that we have found is that pet owners don't, they want to do, they want to make good choices, but the number one question we get is tell me what to do. Like people don't know what to do and they don't know what they don't know. So then when they find out it's the guilt and the feeling of being totally overwhelmed, totally confused. So we wrote this book intentionally to provide clarity, but also a blueprint or a plan. And Rodney um, was able to get much of that information from interviewing the owners of the oldest dogs in the world. And they just had more common sense. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as, as Dr. Karen Brecker is alluding to, you know, when you want to be a millionaire, it's better to sit down with the millionaire and get the advice, not the guy down the street who has all those great ideas and dreams and really never makes ends meet, if you may. So that was really important for us to say, hey, who are these oldest lived dogs and how old can dogs actually live for? I mean, we talk about this all the time. The number one question I believe over what is your dog's name is, oh my gosh, how old is your dog? Literally walk through the park and just listen to people interact with each other when they first, when the dogs first meet. It's always one of the top questions that always comes up. Oh my gosh, you know, how old is your dog? And how old can dogs actually live for? And myself, I know, you know, Gila, you and I have spoken before. As a first time pet parent myself, going through all of these different experiences, I wanted to know how old, how old my dogs could live for. Like, what could I do to get my dogs to live as long as possible? And so, yes, as we started to travel, as we started to connect with other people, pet parents, scientists, researchers, to come to find like the oldest dog in the world, Maggie, at 30 years old, uh, Bushki from Hungary, who lived to be 27, Bramble 25 from the United Kingdom, a 21-year-old Darcy, 22-year-old took her. Like we got to sit with some incredible pet parents, take their stories, everything that they did using the DOGS strategy formula that we had, then go to the world's best, Nobel Prize winning scientists, Harvard University, Dr. David Sinclair, Time Life Magazine's 100 of the most important people on the planet. Like we went to the biggest names that we could find in longevity research and we said, here, Here's the information. Now help us decode this into gems that we can break up into the book that any pet parent can understand, whether you're a first time dog owner, whether you're a scientist, whether you're a young vet student aspiring to be, you know, going get into vet school and be like an incredible veterinarian in the world. Whatever, wherever you are in your life, how can we make this book very digestible? And that was uh, sort of the big breakdown of it. You know, 30 years old. Mm. I Seem, or 26, you know, mm -hmm. late 20s. It almost seems unfathomable, you know, based on what you know today, right? The life of a dog. Um, and I know I probably speak for so many of our audience. I would do anything. I would give up anything if I knew that the decisions I would make would ensure that my my heart dog, I've had four dogs, but the one that's with me today is like without question like that, mm, that little bit different one, Bolo, um, who I had to leave home because she would have been all over me. And I, I wanted to, be able to totally focus on, on you guys here, but yeah, to, to what, what that would take. And, um, and so you mentioned uh, going right to the source, which I absolutely love that. And I wanted to uh, kind of start with that, right? It all starts with the diet and nutrition, but the bigger question you kind of said it already. Um, shall I call you Dr. Becker? Or no, just call me Karen. Hey, okay. you, uh, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Karen's great. <laughs> okay. I definitely will call you Karen instead of, Hey, you, but Karen, <laughs> um, what, yeah, like what got us here? Mm-hmm. We get well, there's not, first of all, what we learned through this journey is that there isn't one culprit. The other big piece that both of us came away from, both of us are foodies and we focus a lot on nutrition and we focus a lot on common sense nourishment. You know, yes, of course you want the food to be species appropriate and yes, you want it to be fresh and yes, you want it to provide all the nutrients and all the uh, fatty acids and all of the phytochemicals that, that are needed for a fantastic cellular response. But we tend to really, prior to writing this book, we 
really focused on food and what going through the exercise of collecting information from the owners of the oldest dogs the environment has a lot to do yeah. with mm. a dog's well-being and people how many times i know you have heard this people say I, i've done everything right i fed an organic diet i fed a free range diet people so heavily focus on the diet but we tend to forget the insidious environmental factors that dramatically and negatively affect our dog's epigenomic expression, as well as their ability to detoxify, as well as the stress, environmental chemical stress, veterinary chemical stress, indoor household chemical stress that negatively impact our dog's well-being. So it's not any one thing that provides a roadblock to dogs' longevity and health span. It's a multitude of things. And I think that even that statement can be totally overwhelmed because people are like, oh no, I got the diet nailed down, but I never thought about, I never thought about the chemicals that my dogs are laying on from my floor cleaner. I never thought about how I'm, you know, putting sprays to get rid of doggy odor all over my dog bed that was already saturated with flame retardant chemicals that are already disrupting my dog's thyroid at home and that are already people are like, oh my gosh, I never thought about those things. We didn't either to the extent that we do now. So it's not one variable, Gila, it's a bunch of variables, but food is the foundation of that. And yeah. genetics is, I mean, let's not forget genetics, right? I mean, there is a, a big component to it. When we sat down with like one of the most incredible cognitive researchers from Hungary, uh, Dr. Nico Kubini, those, those team of Hungarian researchers, Gila, are doing research on genetics and they're primarily looking for these longevity genes. So keep in mind, and sorry, you were probably wondering where Dr. Becker keeps slipping to. Of course, our dogs, Shuby, my little dog, will do everything in her power to like destroy every single podcast that I've ever done. And she's like literally crying in the back. She'll st she always stands right beside where the, the treats in the freezer just are. Just wait. Wait until we start a, a podcast and then she starts in. It's called attention seeking behavior, yeah. and every dog trainer is going to say, You shouldn't be fitting yes. into that, Dr. Becker. And we know it. We are 100% guilty of just, supporting just her. Just trying to. Her salvage the, po the podcast as my dog in the back is I just constantly whining yes. to seven duck feet she's gonna be fine so to go no, back that that is hilarious go ahead so, so to go back to genetics and the importance of genetics like what would it take to have what these researchers in Hungary are calling Methuselah dogs now Methuselah is the oldest lived individual in the Bible. I think he lived to be like 969 years. So I love that they took the term Methuselah and they're calling them Methuselah genes. They, they literally worked with um, a whole bunch of geneticists on this and then computer tech specialists where they had to build this giant supercomputer to decode some of these longest lived dogs. As an example, Bushki from Hungary, who lived to be 27. I mean, there's a whole bunch of studies and research out on this where they literally took Bushki's blood, analyzed his DNA looked inside there to figure out, is he holding a subset of genes that, you know, your typical golden retriever in North America maybe doesn't have. They've been able now to single out genes that are responsible, they believe, for these dogs living well into their 20s. So imagine the future if the next generation of dogs and dogs working with breeders could put these genes into these dogs, these unachievable things that we want to happen like right now, it gives us a promising future. That's what the power of genetics is devastating, especially because humans have intentionally bred dogs in a way the last 400 years that has resulted in terrible things called gene deletions, which means some dogs are just literally missing the genes to have healthy bodies, healthy organs, and live a long, robust life, period. They just are. About, they estimate 10% of dogs are so genetically damaged that it does, when I say it doesn't matter what you do, it does matter what you do, because if you do nothing, your dog will die at three or four. If you do everything, your dog could die at eight or nine. Now, are you doubling that lifespan? Yes, but eight or nine is still a heart rate compared to what we would consider a longer lived dog. So that was a question that we get repeatedly. What if my dog is genetically damaged? Do I still even put forth the effort? Yes, you do, because it's shocking. You can double your dog's lifespan from four to eight by putting forth an effort, but eight is still heartbreaking. And what these geneticists informed us of is because they've identified some of these extra long-lived genes and we know that we have breeds that are missing them Rodney and I are both excited about the fact that we can intentionally pair together breeds that need some genetic repair with DNA dogs that have some incredible genetics to offer and we do have the ability through intentionally 
breeding certain dogs together to improve dog's lifespan. But what do you do if you're like me and I would never buy a dog? All I do is rescue the one-eyed three-legged dog from the pound, like those are my dogs. What do you do about those dogs? Because I'm never gonna shell out money for a, a, a well-bred dog. If I have to just put this in. If you do spend money on a well-bred dog, choose wisely. We cannot stress enough that what we learned from this book is what you don't do is go to a backyard breeder or a pet store or support puppy mills in that you are setting yourself up for genetic heartbreak that can be avoidable. If you rescue dogs, there is every reason under the sun to put forth an effort for every dog in, in our lives. Because what these top geneticists told us is that yes, DNA is there. And DNA absolutely can be up or down regulated, but less than 20% of your dog's overall lifespan and longevity is related to genetics. 80% hmm. our dogs are resting in the palm of our hand and it's up to our good decisions. So genetics are important, but they don't control everything. Yeah, well, you're bringing up again, that point going back to the, every decision I make is healing or harmful. When we're rescuing a dog, or if, we, if someone is making a decision to get a, a a breed of a particular thing they're doing so because we we love the way dogs make us feel they enhance our lives they reduce our stress they make us feel more human in a way that human to human connection doesn't and so in a way there's this little element of selfishness i believe in that it's all about how the dog makes me feel and then this yeah. desire to live a lifestyle and do things with dogs because of in turn it's how i end up feeling as a result of doing those things and I think um, when we, uh, through, through your mission and your movement, when people start to step up and say, you know what, um, I want this for um, my, my dog to, to be with me even longer, but the quality of that time is critical because uh, there's a big, big difference. And you, you highlighted it, I don't recall the exact words, but I remember reading um, you know, about the, you have your lifespan and then you have your health span you know, as it relates to that. And so, so this is, this is really critical, critical work. So